Hi, I'm Erin Schwartz from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I'm here in this segment with Brianna Westbrook, who is running for the state senate in Arizona in Legislative District 22. Hello, Brianna. Hello, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm going to give you our usual first question, which is, tell me a little bit about yourself, about your background, and why you're running for the state senate. Well, I am a, an LGBT activist and a champion for public education. I'm originally from the Phoenix metropolitan area. I first stepped into politics in 2013 as a concerned citizen. That year, I spoke before the Phoenix City Council in support of an anti-discrimination measure to include protections for LGBT people and people with disabilities and public accommodations. Since then, I've worked with Save Our Schools and Outlawed Outlawed Dirty Money initiatives, collecting signatures and talking to voters about the importance of funding our public education and having transparency in our government. My political, like my college and where I came from is not that of a stereotypical politician. I usually tell people, you know, the school I went to is the school of our docs. With the, with the help of um, extended family and friends, I was able to overcome a childhood that was riddled with poverty and substance abuse. Sometimes things were so bad in my childhood, we'd rummage through trash cans for food and often slept in my mother's car. To help raise my siblings, I, I took physically demanding jobs. I've, I've laid asphalt, replaced railroad ties. I eventually ended up finding a job at a local car dealership, and I've been there the last almost 12 years, and I've quickly advanced through multiple promotions and became one of the top sales managers in my region. Through these experiences in my life and my work ethic, I'd like to take that to the Arizona State Capitol and and create policies that work for people um, with real empathy at heart for the issues at hand. So you had previously run for office in the special election in the Arizona 8th Congressional District. You were in the primary against uh, Geralta Bernani, who's also been on the podcast. And you had done very well in that primary. You won about 40% of the vote, but it it wasn't enough to win the primary. And I remember being very impressed at the time that you had very quickly turned around and supported Geralta Bernani in her then general special election, and that very soon afterward, you announced that you'd be running for the state Senate. Since our audience is often asking us to talk to people who have not won their elections, wanted to to get a chance to ask you about that too, about running for Congress and then about, you know, deciding what to do next. Well, kind of what happened was pretty unique. You know, if it hadn't been for the resignation of Trent Franks in the fall, I'd still be running for Congress. Generally, after a loss, you have to wait a few years, but Given that that timetable was shortened with the special election due to Trent Franks' resignation, I was put into a, a question of whether or not after that loss, maybe I should run for the full term in the fall, which would possibly and more than likely cause some tension in Arizona politics, could possibly boil down to something maybe vaguely like we saw in 2016, just a split between Democrats and I did some heavy thinking after that loss and really thought to myself, you know, do I want to run for office again? You know, because it was really draining. You know, it's, it's a lot of time and energy um, that, I, that I put into that campaign and we fell short. But we did really, really well. And, and that is what really pushed me to go to the next level and, and say, you know what, let's, uh, let's, let's continue this fight. I had talked with our local party officials, the Democratic Party, and they had told me, I said, you know, my my goal is I want to be in politics long term, you know, because I want to create policies and and be a champion for people in government, because in my opinion, we don't have that in a lot of our um, elected positions currently in Arizona. And one of the party officials told me, well, why don't you run for state Senate LD22? You know, that was your best performing legislative district in the primary. And so I started thinking about running for state. I'm like, well, it's, it's definitely not as quote unquote, sexy is an option as running for Congress. You know, it's not that 
you know, it's not the, the big, the big race, but I started looking at policies and where our state is going. And I said, why not? Why, why, why can't I run for state Senate? And uh, let's work in parallel with Haral. So Haral and I ended up, you know, talking, our teams got together and we decided to work with one another. And uh, hopefully I can help bring people down ballot and keep everybody engaged in the political process out here and uh, still energized to show up at the polls in November because we have a unique opportunity to have two strong candidates on the ballot at the same time, not competing against one another, but helping elevate who we have to offer as far as Democrats in Arizona's West Valley. And you're actually doing some joint canvassing Mm -hmm. together. Yeah, we've we've been doing a lot of things together. Um, I've partnered with the local house candidates that are running in LD22 and in Haral. And we've been basically sharing our resources to make sure that we all succeed. Because this is a, a, a very important year in our election. We really are deciding our future in November. And it's, it's very important that we stick together and stay unified, even if we don't agree on every single policy. But if there's still a few things that we do agree on, possibly like money and politics and getting that out of the political system, you know, we need to continue to stay together and arm in arm, because if we don't and we lose in November, who knows the direction this country is going to go. Can you tell me a little bit about Legislative District 22? Whereabouts in Arizona is this? And, and what are the the concerns of the people who live in that district? It's in the Northwest Valley, of the Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, cities um, included in LD22 would be the Sun Cities, which is Sun City Grand, Sun City West, um, in the original Sun City, we also have Surprise, Arizona, where there's a lot of young families. We have a, a, a small portion of Peoria and uh, Glendale. It's uh, one of the largest legislative districts in CD8. As far as average age, right around mid-60s is around our average. And the makeup of the district um, is grossly outnumbered by Republicans compared to Democrats. And that does not scare me. We have a large number of independents out here, too. By the numbers, we have roughly 31,000 Democrats, 49,000 independents, and 68,000 Republicans. So we face a, an uphill battle. Prior to announcing the state Senate campaign and releasing my platform, I made it a very important move and uh, something that maybe possibly isn't done, but I feel like it should be. I went out and talked to people of all political affiliations before releasing my platform, because just based off the numbers alone, Democrats can't win. So we need to be appealing um, to people on all sides of the political spectrum, Republicans and independents, because we're going to need them to win. Um, the things that I've heard commonly from, from people at doors and, and phones and in and, and these meetings is education. Um, education in Arizona is, is really important. We have one of the worst student to teacher ratios in the country and our teacher pay is, is downright deplorable. Um, we're losing teachers to that are that are they're going to school here, then they're leaving after they leave school um, and going to neighboring states and making ten to fifteen thousand dollars more, which has led our classrooms to have obscene amounts of numbers of children. You know, I talked to one teacher who teaches government in the Deer Valley Unified School District when I was running for Congress, who told me he had forty two kids in his class. And that's just way too many. Um, So what I'd like to do is fund our education system appropriately. I'd like to increase teacher pay and and funding for the classrooms so they have the tools necessary, new books, technology. And I feel like when we do that and we we pay our teachers a living wage, we can decrease our class sizes because teachers won't leave. I also have a lot of young people that are are going to school um, and they're strapped by student loan debt. So I'd like to make sure that we have an educated workforce so when people do come to Arizona, we'll, we can be prepared in a, a very talented workforce ready to take on the jobs of tomorrow. So I'd like to provide a pathway to Duck Free Community College, um, let our, our communities thrive and, and be educated. I also want to invest in our state's infrastructure. APS has really held the purse strings for a lot of things out here. There are our public utility for electricity, what they restricted us from going to renewable energy and, and have put up barriers. I'd like to open our state up to possibly becoming the, the solar capital of the United States of America. We have a very unique climate. We don't have much rain and hardly ever our, our sky is cloudy. So I'd like to, to see us become a leader in renewable energy because we really do have the perfect climate for it. 
And I also want to extend our mass transit. Um, I've been to a lot of other cities throughout the United States. And Phoenix is, is very challenging if you're um, relying on public um, transportation. Our bus system doesn't go out to the Northwest Valley. It's more focused in the East Valley. Um, with, so what it's doing by not extending it out here um, is we are missing economic opportunities. So people from the East Valley and Central Phoenix can't come out to our neck of the woods on public transportation to spend money in our local small businesses and vice versa. We, you know, I have a large retirement community in my district. You know, there's people that would love to go downtown on an afternoon, but they're terrified to go on our overcrowded freeways. Um, so I'd like to make sure they bring the buses out and eventually maybe bring a light rail out this way. And there's also another unique thing I'd like to do um, as far as bringing revenue to the state of Arizona and giving us another good, good option um, to hold some corporations accountable, particularly Cox and CenturyLink are two internet providers out here. I'd like to offer a public option to internet, um, a thing called municipal broadband. It's popping up in cities throughout the country. I'd like to bring that to Arizona so we can hold Cox and CenturyLink accountable. We can combat any repeals to net neutrality and implement our own. It would offer it at less than $20 a household and it would operate at twice the speed. Chattanooga has the fastest internet in the entire country and they are um, basically the, the brainchild of municipal broadband. So if you'd like to learn more about it, maybe I'd suggest any of your uh, listeners reading into that. That sounds great. I'd like that. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great service. There's over 700 municipalities that have a public option internet and the ACLU recently published an article too, as far as if you want to combat, you know, repeal net neutrality, you need to offer these public options to internet. And, and we, how, how they're made is how, how these municipalities are doing it. A lot of them are doing our revenue bonds. So the city is going to be making money from this eventually. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's definitely the, the way that we need to go because we can keep Cox and CenturyLink accountable out here for their price gouging and throttling our internet speeds. And, you know, we can keep make sure that our data is protected by implementing our own net neutrality. And another thing, too, I need to make sure that I mention it because it's equally as important because I really have four pillars to my platform. Um, the next would be healthcare and responsible gun ownership laws. Out here in Arizona, I'd like to increase and expand our, our state Medicaid system. It's called Access and Protect Kids Care. And I also want to invest in senior care facilities. I had a roundtable with Ability360 a week and a half ago. I got all of the leaders together um, in the disability community and um, the homeless community um, and the drug rehabilitation community um, for, for a talk. And we have a lack of funding for these social programs, particularly senior care facilities. And we have a large amount of people that are coming here to retire. And we're going we're gonna to need people to help those people at the tail end of their lives. And there's just a shortage of it. So I'd like to make sure that we invest in funding properly for those social programs to make sure that people can live healthy, independent lives. And lastly, tagging back on that responsible gun legislation, I'd like to make sure that we're a lot more responsible when it comes to firearm sales in Arizona. Currently, if you buy a gun in the state of Arizona from a private individual, you can basically swap cash in the gun um, at a grocery store parking lot and there's no record of that transaction. I think that's very sloppy and I think that's dangerous. So what I'd like to do is, is see firearm sales with individuals recorded similar to a transaction if you buy a car here, private party in Arizona. You have to go to um, a notary and get the title notarized and that, that, that transaction is recorded. I'd like to see something similar to that here. And I'd also like to make sure that we implement red flag rules. So if someone's been charged with multiple accounts of domestic violence, you know, I, th I don't think they should have firearms in their house because that's been proven. You know, victims of, of gun violence are five times more likely to die in a home where there's domestic violence. So these, these common sense gun policies is something that crosses the party line and Republicans and independents and Democrats are ready for them. The current incumbent for this seat is term limited. She can't run again. What are you sort of hearing as you're talking to people? The Last election in 2016, the Republican won by a pretty healthy margin. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like that's changing a little bit this year? Are you getting a sense that this is a district that you can really turn around? I'll tell you, I'll tell you this about running for office for both my congressional campaign and this campaign. 
is a lot of pundits mark off these districts because of sheer voter registration numbers. 